morning, everybody. It is good to see everybody here today. Sorry, I'm looking at Lindy and Trello. By the way, Lindy, out of my office, close the door. Thank you. I was watching. Speaking with authority. Yes. I had to. Uh, yeah, I got. I got. I have to get your your kids next time I see them. I think they were in my office yesterday playing with my new sword I got. Yeah, I have a sword in my hat. It's actually, it was, uh, you know, today is uh, Scott's memorial service this afternoon. And uh, Scott had this, the only thing that I was interested in at all that I thought was really neat when we were cleaning out his apartment yesterday is he had this wooden katana. It's a sword, like a Japanese sword. Uh, it's just really cool. It's wooden and all that. And I got that as my my memory of it and things. So, so it was in there. And uh, I think Griff's kids snuck in yesterday to play with it. That's okay. My kids keep playing with it and I keep having to get on time. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Welcome again to church. It's good to see. We've got a few folks out today, it looks like. Um, but the Lord is here and that's what counts. And that's a great thing. So this morning, I wanted to just do, Amber, if you would come up with me. Amber's going to be sitting in the back kind of, she's kind of be overseeing our kids and stuff. Uh, Y'all know we have the nursery back there. Um, but right now, just with thing, the way things are, we're not staffing the nursery right now um, but we're saying that if, if you have a one through three year old if you need to change diapers if you feel like you need to go sit whatever else um, I don't know Ethan is the TV on back there can you go check and see the TV and make sure it's working with the thing it, it should have the service going back there so if you have a young child um, you can go back there change a diaper whatever the service should be on the television uh, if, it, if it's not up I'll do that real quick when the video is going in a few minutes but um, so, but that's for, for just uh, adults have to be with the kids in there just simply because Amber's been making sure everything's sprayed down and everything's just kind of clean. So if you have a child you need to go in there, you're welcome to go in, change diapers, uh, sit in there with your child, feed a baby, whatever we need to do, you're welcome to do that in there. Um, but, uh, but we're not going to open and staff it right now uh, for various reasons. All right? All right, well, this morning we've got something because we finally have a Sunday. Um, where some um, very special people are all here right now. Um, so just wanted to um, uh, to acknowledge them this morning. Miss Cindy, would you come up? And Brother Bob, would you mind coming up? And Miss April, would you mind coming up? Uh -huh. <laughs> Many of you know that, um, that these three folks have accepted Christ as their Savior. And... Uh, and we went out to the pond and baptized. And we've got some others that we're going to be baptizing soon. In fact, uh, we need to talk today about that for some of you. But we, we're going to be baptizing soon. But we went out to the pond and we baptized at various times. You know something? The Lord is working and the Lord is blessing. Um, I think it is wonderful because I, I keep hearing, I go online and, and I look at a lot of the pastor stuff. And uh, I don't know if you know it, but, um, but hundreds of churches are closing each week. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, it seems that we are entering those end times. We all know that in the end times that um, people will turn away from God. People will listen for things that tickle their ears rather than hearing the true word of God. So many things that the Bible says. But the Lord has blessed here. Bakerman, Nebraska, Dundee County is not dead spiritually. God is here. God is working. And we can see that right now. We're excited about that. And just in sort of a remembrance, a recognition of that, and to, to give these folks something that they can remember and, and think about in the future, um, we've got here uh, some baptism certificates. Make sure afterwards to come and say, let me see yours, let me see yours. You know, let them leave until they show you the baptism certificate. But we've got some baptism certificates. And I also went ahead and took some of the pictures that we took on those days and printed out a little picture thing to stick in there with it so you can remember that day and the dates and everything else from that. All right? So... Yeah, so Miss April. And Brother Bob. And I tried to get whole names put on the certificates. So, and let's see. All right. And the Lord is blessed. Let's give him a hand. If you would, if you're able to, stand to your feet and let's sing together. Brethren, we have met to worship. All right. 
Let's sing it together.
interesting to you too, wasn't it? That was the temple of God. Now, I don't know, you couldn't really tell as much there, but all of that shininess and stuff, that was all gold, solid gold and silver and all kinds of precious metals and some of the best wood in all the world was shipped in for the beams and for the structure and all of that kind of stuff. You can actually read in the Bible all the details about how God had outlined it to be made and built. And it was the greatest thing, I think, that was ever built in the whole world. It took years and years and years to build it, and it took thousands and thousands of people to build it. It took a long time. Okay? But here's the thing about that. Okay? The temple was there for a reason. Let me ask you something. Did you? The temple was called the house of God. Okay? It was the place where God would dwell, right? That's what dwell means, where he lived. Okay? But do you think really God just came and was only living there? He just was in there like his living room and his house and he didn't go anywhere else? No. He was everywhere, wasn't he? But the problem was, at this time, was that people couldn't see him. Because remember, we had sin that, that separated us away from God, so people couldn't see Him. So people really didn't even know when they prayed, when they got on their knees and they prayed and they asked God to help them, they really didn't know one way or the other if God was listening to them or not listening to them. And should they, is He over here? Is He over there? Is He behind me somewhere? Where is He? They couldn't find Him. They couldn't figure it out. So God did something. He said, listen, I'm going to make this place. Linda Rose, listen. He said, I'm going to make this place and I'm going to call it my house and I'm going to dwell there, which means that I'll always be looking from here. Okay, we're going to read some scriptures to the adults in a few minutes that talks about the temple and how God promises that he will always see us and see what's going on. Okay, but this temple, what he said was, listen, I'll, this is like a place that you can look to. And when you look, look here, when you come here, when you pray with this in mind, you know, because I promise you that I will always, always hear you, see you, and help you. Okay? Because this is the place that I will dwell, and I will be there for you. Okay? But something changed when Jesus came. Something changed. And this scripture tells us what? It says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says, Do you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? So when Jesus came, things were different. Because he said, no longer am I going to just be in the temple and you can look to a temple and pray towards the temple and know that I'm hearing you. I promise I'll hear you. He says, no longer is that fancy building with all the gold that took thousands of people to build and hundreds of, or many, many years, not hundreds of years, but a lot, a lot of years to build. Not only am I going to dwell in that place, but instead now, my spirit is going to come and dwell inside of where? Now, you saw, you saw this beautiful, beautiful place with solid gold and silver and, and artwork etched into the walls and everywhere else. It was gorgeous weather. It was beautiful. But I'm going to try to look at something. Y'all look over there at Mark. Wait, Mark. You see Mark? Did you know that that is the temple of God? Hey, Griff, wave at me. See Griff, wave at me. See, wave at me. Did you know that that is the temple of God? Even Peter, believe it or not, as ugly as he is, look at him. He, wait, Peter, just kidding, Peter. Peter is the temple of God. All these people, you can be the temple of God when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, the Holy Spirit, instead of going and dwelling in a building, a beautiful building that was built, He comes and He dwells inside of us. And so we are His temple. But the promise remains the same. The promise remains the same. That He says... In his temple, which is now you and me, if we accept Jesus, in his temple, he will always hear us. He will always see us. And he will be with us forever and ever. Isn't that a great thing? That beautiful, beautiful building. And now we are his beautiful building. That's a neat thing. Ms. Amber, if you'll make your way up for me, let's pray. And then we'll hand out our stuff. Ready? Let's pray. Dear God, we love you today. We thank you, God, that you are a God who hears our prayers who is with us always and saves us. Lord God, thank you that we can be your temple, that your spirit now dwells in us, Lord. And when we pray, we know you hear us, and we know that you care about us. God bless us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hold on, let me get you stuff.
We've got a new one today. Moms and dads, I've been trying to give the older ones a little bit harder puzzles and stuff. They have a word search here uh, without, without a suggestion of words. So you might have to help them with a few things, but, but they can come up with a lot of it too. Or crisscross, I should have followed you that way. Oops. Did anybody bring their color sheets back from last week? Anybody? You did? All right, well, good deal. You can get with me afterwards then. All right, just one more. Man, oh, yes. That's right. Take some back to the back here. Oh, like that. Oh, you want a different one? Oh, we'll get a different one. Here you go. Come find you one right there. Right there. See which one you like. All right. Here we go. Who knows this song? Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Now, I'm introducing you to a few here. Uh, even a few of the old Southern Gospel ones and a couple of praise and worship style, things like that. But who knows this one? Raise your hand. Tessa, raise your hand. Anybody else? We've got a couple here. She knows it. Oh, a couple there. Very good, very good. Some of this is some, some Southern Gospel style stuff. Things that I picked up that I didn't even know until I went to Amber's, until I married Amber and went to her daddy's church and they sang all this old kind of stuff. Um, but this is just a fun song. It's an upbeat song. A little bit of bluegrass sound put into it. But let's just sing and worship God together. Blessed Jesus, hold on here. Let's stand and sing together if you're able. I might have to turn this one up a little bit, Miss Deeks. I think it's lower than the other ones were.
you all the praise because you are good. Lord God, you are the one who gives us wisdom and direction. You guide us. Lord, even in the times of trouble, Lord, you bring us to good places. And you lead us beside those still waters. Oh, Lord, you are the one that gives us rest. Lord, you are the one who loves us. Can you be all the glory, all the honor, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We want to be in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Um, it's after the kings in the Old Testament. We have 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. We talked a little bit about the book last week, and we looked at some of the, um, the begots, the genealogies there at the beginning, and found an interesting, right there in the middle of it, uh, an interesting little sentence about a man named Jabin. Well, time goes by. We hear the story as we read in, in, in 1 Corinthians, and we read the story of the nation of Israel, and then we move into 2 Corinthians. Remember, these were, were they're, they're two books, and they were two scrolls back then, but they were just two scrolls because it was too long to be one scroll. So they split it into two, but it's one continuous story, the story of Israel. And one thing I didn't mention last week, which I thought was, was an interesting note. Um, you know, when we look at Scripture, one of the things that I love about Scripture the most, I don't know if that's this thing doing that or what, but the, one of the things I love about Scripture is the idea that it doesn't pull any punches. It doesn't make people out to be these great, perfect people when they're not. We read in Samuel and we read in Kings about David, and even though he was one of the greatest men, a man after God's own heart, we also know that at one point he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. At one point he actually turned away from his God, his people, everything at one point in his life. He struggled from time to time with sin. But the thing about David was that he always came back. Always came back repentant. In fact, you read of David. When David repented, David did, just didn't look up and say, Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I haven't had to do that anymore. David hit the ground. He would rip his clothes. He would pour ashes on his head. When he repented, he repented fully, recognizing what he had done and how horrible it was. And he would come back to God. But remember, we said that the books of Chronicles, the point of that was to remind people of God's goodness. Remind people that the Messiah would come. Remind people that the faith that they had put their faith in, the temple, all of these things were standing and still standing that God was still working through His, His priests and, and the faith that He had given them and, the, and, the, and the, the whole order that He had given them. And it was for encouragement. So as you read in Chronicles, you won't read about David's murder, times of murder. You won't read about the adultery. You won't read about the other things that, that were negative because what Chronicles does is it takes people's minds and their attention, puts them back to the stories that they know, and helps them to recognize, yes, these people did bad things, these people were stupid at the time, but here's how God still worked. In spite of who they were, in spite of their sin, in spite of the evil, the bad things that were on, that were on them and with them much of their lives. So Chronicles is not a book to look back at the negative. It would look back at what God did through the history of this nation. Okay? Now, we get to the point in the story where Solomon would build the temple. Y'all know David, a man after God's own heart, his heart, his desire was to build a great temple for God, to worship Him and to serve Him in that temple. We saw the video earlier on the kids thing. It was a beautiful thing, structure. It was, it was gold and silver and, and the finest of wood shipped in from other places. Just all kinds of beauty and artwork and, and all the best of the best would come in and work on this building because it was the best of the best to honor God himself. And David wanted to build this. But God said, no, David. I love you. But you are a man of war. I have a purpose for your life. And the purpose in your life is to protect your people. To strengthen your nation. But I will give to your son, Solomon, 
I will give him the right to build my temple. So Solomon, even at a young age, he takes all of the treasure. David went ahead and started amassing all of the things, the building materials, the treasures, all the rest that were needed to build the temple. And so Solomon came in and he began building. It was years and years and years and years. But he finally gets to the point to where it is built. And they have this great celebration. All this is in, these, in the chapters just previous to chapter 7 here. It's, 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 he gets to the point it's built. And, and he gathers all the people. People come from everywhere. From the farthest reaches of Israel. And even other countries to come and to see this great site. And to worship the one true God. They all gather together and Solomon comes before him, the great king and great leader, and he prays and he asks God's blessing upon this place and upon Israel as they worshipped him there. The people celebrated for seven straight days, day and night, worshipping God, celebrating the temple. Then things calmed down a little bit. People started to go back home. Solomon went back to his home, the palace. He had also built a palace during this time for the kings that would rule there in Jerusalem. So he goes back to his palace. And here's where we pick up. In verses 12 through 16 of chapter 7. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place, for now I have chosen and sanctify this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Let me throw out a couple of quick things. You know, I, I spoke about I spoke about the temple before uh, when I was talking to the kids, and I said that of course we now are that temple. But why was the temple built? Why was it important that God would, would, would allow Solomon to build this place that people could go to? Now, does it mean that God would confine himself in this place and you couldn't find him anywhere else unless you went to the temple? No, even the kids knew that this morning. No, it wasn't that, that, that it was a place that God would just sit on himself and you would have to come to him. That was not the point. The point was that for many, since sin had, had separated us from God, sin had killed that spirit within us that links us to God, it was hard for people to find God. Some of you that accepted Christ, especially later in life, think back to before your salvation. Think about those times when you were in dread and you were in sorrow and you tried to reach out to God. Was He right there? Was it easy to find Him? Could you look Him in the eye? Could you just feel Him just right there with you always? Chances are no. Because we were separated, our sins separated us from Him. And there were others even in Scripture from earliest times. Uh, who knows what the earliest book, the first, uh, the long, the, excuse me, the oldest book we have in Scripture, the Old Testament. Which one was it? I'll give you clues. Not Genesis. <clears throat> Book of Job. Okay? History-wise. Okay? Job was, was probably older than Abraham. Job was possibly uh, a contemporary, as in Job may have still been alive during the time of Abraham, um, when Abraham was very, was very young, but probably died. So he was before Abraham. So we're talking about very ancient times here, the story of Job. And let me read something about Job. Job was a man who sought God. Job was a man who wanted to find God, who wanted to worship Him, who wanted to beg His help in the situation he was in. In Job 9, 14-16, he said, How then can I answer Him and choose my words to reason with Him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer Him. I would beg mercy of my judge if I called and He answered me. I would not believe that He even listened to my voice. Job was at a place where he didn't even know if he called out, if he did pray to God, if he asked God to help him, he didn't even think he would hear it because he was so great. He, he spoke of God in many other places and how great he was and all of the things that he created and, 
and, and who was Job to even call upon him? If I called out to him, he would probably wouldn't even listen to me. Because I'm so small and he's so big. Then over in verse 32, he says, For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, and that he should go to court together, that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from him. I can imagine this section here. Listen to this section. And imagine the agony. Think of the time in your heart that you felt the most alone. The most separated from God, from family, from everybody. You were there by yourself completely alone. And he cries out and he says, let him take his rod away from me. And do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I will speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. Imagine that horrible place where, where, where someone feels that, that they can't find God. That God is so big they recognize Him truly for who He is and how great He is, but they don't recognize His love. They don't recognize that, that, that He is listening to them, that He wants to be with them, He wants to bless them, and they just feel alone. Imagine that place. This is where much of Israel was. They knew the Messiah was coming, but the Messiah has not come yet. They did their best to follow these rules and the law that was given, but how many of them fulfilled the law? Any of them? No. Not a one. So where was the hope? What could they look to? How could they know that God would even listen to them? They looked forward to the Messiah who would come. That mediator, as Job talked about, but he wasn't here yet. If only there was somewhere, something that they could look to, somewhere they could go, something that was there that was a promise from God that if they spoke, that He would hear them. Do you see now why it's important that the temple was there? Our church today is a wonderful place. My friends, you don't have to come here. I don't think any of us think that you have to come here to find God. Because we know Him. We know that when we speak, He inclines His ear. He leans over the edge of heaven and He hears us. We know that. So we can be anywhere we can cry out to Him. But at this time, this time, what's going on? Let's see, just, yeah, just turn that off there. I'll speak louder. So imagine this place where you can't find God. And you don't even know if you cry out to Him if He even hears you or not. But imagine there was a place that God Himself had consecrated, that God Himself had blessed. And He said that my presence will be in this place. And when you pray towards this place or you, you come to this place and you speak to me, I promise you, I will hear you. Imagine the hope that that gives. No longer is their prayers going up not knowing if it's hitting the, hitting the wall of the sky or if it's getting in God's ear or not because He has promised now, if you will come to this place, I will hear you. That is the hope that was given for this temple. So Solomon heard God and he said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. A place that his people could come and connect back with God. But then he changes it. He says, and when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Understand this, okay? I have always been one that my theology is such that I do not believe that God stands in heaven waiting for you to sin so that he can send a lightning bolt down to zap you, okay? We've talked about that before. I believe that what comes into this world... These pestilences, these famines, all these other things are reactions of this world because we brought sin in, we corrupted this world, and it's not what it was created to be. And now there are natural consequences to what we do. Okay? But understand this too. Okay, there's a both and here. Yes, sin or you know, plagues and pestilence and famine and disease and all these things, yes, they are consequences, natural consequences of what we do and how we sin. But understand this, nothing happens in this world without the authority of God upon it. My friends, even evil. 
Evil cannot happen. It is not that God sends evil. It is not that God promotes evil. But God allows us. Why? Because from the beginning, He has given us choice. And we as a people, not saying you individually, me individually, any individual, but we as a people, as a whole, have chosen sin and chosen to corrupt this world. So we have chosen the disease that follows. We have chosen the fires and the earthquakes and the tornadoes. We have chosen the hurricanes. We have chosen coronavirus. We have chosen these things by our own actions and by our own choices. And by our choice, God has allowed those things to be. So God says, when I send these things, when these things come, do you understand the second point about this? There is a difference between, to use the, our, our current term, the secular world and we who are Christians. Let me ask you this. If you went up to the school and you saw a kid bullying another kid and you went over there and didn't know this kid from anybody and snatched him up and tore their behind up, what would happen to you? You'd go to jail. You'd be sued. All kinds of things, right? We do not punish, we do not, sometimes we'll correct and verb, but we don't punish those who are not ours, do we? Mm -hmm. Really, God doesn't either. People in this world suffer, suffer the natural consequences of this world. But I will tell you this, God will punish us when we need it. God will pick us up and tear up our behinds when we need it. Why? You know, there are times that my kids, they start going in a different direction. And they need their behinds tore up because if they don't, they'll continue in that direction. And I know that direction leads to destruction. So my spanking them or my correcting them, my punishing them in some way, helps them to realize what you're doing is wrong. There are consequences to what is wrong. And now change what you're doing. So understand the second point is God will punish us. God will spank us when He needs to. Okay? But when He does this, whether it's by some natural, you want to think it's by natural means or direct something from God, it doesn't really matter because the point is these things are here. They were brought on by our sin. But when these things happen, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? He goes on in verse 14. Probably one of the, one of the most popular verses that has gone since all of the corona stuff has started and these other things. This is the verse that's been thrown out there a lot and it isn't because it's a good verse. He says, if my people, who are his people? Right now, in our present day and age, who is his people? We are the church, right? Those of us that know him as Savior. So, if my people who are called by my name, what are we called, by the way? Christians, Christians followers of Christ, exactly. Those that are called by His name. Those that are followers of Him. Those that are the worshipers, the true worshipers of the one true God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. How hard is that to do? You might say, well, it's not that hard. Well, it is. It is. It, 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 it's hard. I mean, even for those who have studied God's Word and who have a strong relationship with God... In fact, sometimes it seems harder for us preachers and theologians and Sunday school teachers, sometimes it seems harder for us to humble ourselves than it is for you. Why? Well, because we've led people to Christ. Because we know God's Word and we can teach it to others. Because we, we struggled and strive to live God's, you know, God's way. And, and, and when you have questions, we're able to answer you. And, and, and it's good that we can answer you. We have that knowledge. God has blessed us with that. So in all of that understanding and that knowledge and where we are, we can pretty much handle anything that comes along. God, you just hang out. We've got this. <laughs> it almost seems the closer you get to God, sometimes the harder it is to be humble. But if we will humble ourselves, what does that mean? It means quit thinking we have all the answers. Quit looking around and when a problem arises or something happens, saying, well, well this is the answer. If you just do it this way, everything will be okay. My goodness, I'm sorry, y'all, but I, I, I've had Facebook since 2009. The reason that I got it was because my youth group had it. And then from there on, 
be honest with you, a lot of y'all won't tell me what's going on. You won't tell me when you're sick. You won't tell me things that are going on. So I look on there and I find out a lot of stuff. And I go through it at least once a day. I flip through because I want to see what's going on and all that. But I also see so much other stuff. And I can't unfriend you or whatever else because I need to know what's going on. I want to go over what's going on in your life. But you've got all of these answers. Just put out there. Like the answer to the whole world is this. Or the answer to the whole world is that. Everybody in the world is stupid because if they just knew this, everything would be solved again. I don't know if you know it, but on your Facebook pages when you put all this stuff, that's what it seems like to everybody else. You're the smartest. You're the best. You know all the answers. Everybody else is stupid. There you go. My friends, that is not humility. Humility falls on their face and begs God to tell us what to do. Humility falls on their face and begs God to help us with what's going on. Humility says, I believe that this is the best candidate right now for these reasons. But my friend, trust God. Seek God because He is the true answer. My friends, a true humility says, yes, these evils are going on. But doing evil because of this evil is not the answer. True humility recognizes that I don't have the answers. And if you want to put something on Facebook, then put on there, please join me today and pray and beg God to give us answers, to give us direction, to give us wisdom. God, please bless and help our country. If you want to be humble, then do that. A political party is not the answer. A particular person is not the answer. Understand, Many of you are putting all this out about one person or another person. Understand that at some point there will be a man come and he's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. He's going to have all the answers. He's going to be just perfect. Everybody's going to be for him until after a period of about three and a half years when he turns and says, now you will do what I say. Be careful about putting your trust in man. That is why the Bible says that even the elite, when that antichrist comes, even the elite, will be tricked. Because we have this tendency to turn to a party or to a man or to an organization rather than recognizing that God is the answer. And my responsibility is God, what do you want me to do right here, right now? Humbling ourselves, recognizing that we don't have the answer. So if my people who are called by name will humble themselves, and if they humble themselves, what will they do then? They will pray and seek my face. <coughs> you know, we pray, right? Do we really pray? My family, we pray at our meal time. We pray for the kids before they go to bed as a family. Uh, we pray when we go on a trip so that we're safe. We do a lot of praying, and that's good stuff. And I think it's good stuff. It's things we should do. I would, I would encourage you to join in those things. Because it is God who brings the blessing of, of our provision. It is God who keeps us safe. And, and, and it, it's God who provides for all. So, so it's good things to do. Okay, It's good things to do. Don't, don't think at all that I'm going to say that there's anything wrong with it. That is great. That is wonderful. But I think my children will tell you that when I pray, when I pray, I, I tend to pray specifically for the circumstance of the situation. I'm not one of these. I, I, I've come across people before that have prayed and they've stood in church and, and had an opening prayer for the service. And I guess they had prayed enough that week because they go over everything you can imagine to pray about um, in the world and their friends and what's going on and what they should do. And, and it goes on and on and on and on. And to be honest with you, I just ask them to please pray that God will bless them and His Spirit be welcome here in this place at this time. But they go on and on and on and on. You know, but for the most part, I think most of our prayers are usually pretty specific. And when I pray for my kids at bedtime, there's specific things that I typically say over and over again. There's nothing wrong with that because it's truly from my heart. This is what I am truly praying. This is what I really want to be. But there are other times that we need to be like that man who stands in the appropriate time and the appropriate place. Maybe going into our closet, going in somewhere away from everyone. Somewhere where the phone is turned off, where, where, where there are no distractions. And we truly get down... And we begin not only to talk to God about what we want Him to know, but then also to take time to listen. Because prayer is not just us talking at God. Prayer is communication. It's speaking to God and waiting to hear what He has to say. 
When we think of prayer in that way, maybe some of us are not praying as often as we need to. But if we will pray and seek His face, what does that mean? When I talk to my kids, here's, here's the two reactions I get. Well, three reactions. I'll give you three reactions. Here's one reaction. Carlina Marie. Her eyes are real big. Because she knows she's just done something wrong, and I'm about to get her. <laughs> okay. Or, um, Joshua Random. Joshua Random. Joshua Random. <laughs> Joshua Random! Huh? Okay. Alright, there we go. Alright. And then, the only reason I'm using Ethan in this last one is because this happened the other day. Michael Ethan. Because not because he is not satisfied with us, so he has put us away or taken his blessings. 
but because we have chosen to step away from him. And step away from the blessings that he wants to come upon us naturally because of who we are. We are his. So it says here that if we will, we will pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, what does that mean? Remember the word repentance means to turn away from completely and go in another direction. Where do we go? We go to here. We go to God. We turn away from our sins. Does that mean that we'll never turn and step this way again? No. But it means then that we were reminded, we recognize when we step out of that blessing. So we repent, we turn back, and we go back to God. Sometimes that happens. But if we will then turn from our wicked ways back towards God, if we will turn from our wicked ways, then He will hear from heaven. And He will forgive our sins. He will forgive their sins and heal their land. If the people will turn away from the way they thought it should be, all of the legalistic things, all the extra rules. Remember, God created the Ten Commandments. He made another structure for their people, but then what? They took it and ran with it, made thousands upon thousands of other rules. On the Sabbath day, make it holy. Well, you can only walk so many steps or you're exercising too much. You can't pull your, if something happens, an emergency happens, you can't do this, you can't do that. Don't you pick any grain and feed yourself on that day because that's work and that's easy. They made all kinds of rules and piled it on. Made a way themselves that they thought would create a stairway going up to heaven that they could make it to heaven on their own desires, their own rules. It is God's way. So if we will turn from our wicked ways, turn from all of those ways we think are ours towards Him, then He will forgive our sins and He will heal our land. He says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. He's talking about the temple now here. Remember Joe's cry? He didn't know where to turn, where to look, how to find God. He says, I'm going to be here. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive and prayers made in this place. You come here, I promise you, I guarantee you will be heard. I will hear you and I will see you. He says, for now, I have chosen and sanctified. That means set apart. He's made a place set apart for our good. Okay, this is for us that He has given this temple. Not for Himself, because He hears us anyways, doesn't He? But for our reassurance... To give us something tangible that we can hold on to. Something that, a promise that we can hold on to firmly. He gave them the temple. And then He sanctified it. He set it apart for the rest of the world. He said, this place is special. This place is different. I will come down and I will actually dwell in this place. My spirit will come down in this place. As it did the tabernacle of old. As they traveled through the wilderness. He said, I will sanctify this house. That my name will be there forever. And my eyes, my eyes, that's his attention. He will look for those who come to him. And my heart, that's his concern. He cares for them. So that my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually, forever and always. He will never go there and he not be there. Now, what does that mean for us? For our nation, yes, it does mean just as it said. That if we will turn, if we will pray, we will seek His face, we will turn from our wicked ways. He will forgive us of our sin and He will heal our land. Our land can be healed if we turn to Him. But understand this, when you watch the news and there's all these battles going on back and forth, understand that's because the majority of our country, if God's standing up here and He looks down at our country, He sees evil and the desires of an evil heart. I'm not talking about a political party because I'm an independent. I think both parties have evil in them. Okay? But he sees people's hearts. As we learned in 1 Samuel, when the people wanted a king, what did God do? He gave them the desire of their hearts. He will do the same for us. If we choose in this nation evil, if we don't stand against the murder of thousands upon thousands of innocent children, if we don't stand against the immorality that just floods through our school systems and everywhere else, 
if we, even if we agree with the initial premise, if there are people that are, that are hurting people, that are burning things down, that are causing destruction, even if we agree with the initial premise of why they're angry and we stand for what is evil, then we are wrong. If our country as a whole, if the majority of our people will pray, will seek God's face, will turn from our wicked ways, He will hear us, he will, he will forgive us, and He will heal our land. But my friends, if that does not happen, healing will not occur. But, <laughs> let's make this a little more personal. You say, Brother Mike, you don't have a lot of a lot of hope for the future of our country and our world. Yeah, I do. But in a different way. Because sadly, when I read in Scripture, I know the way our world is going like so. It's not good. But I know in the end, it will be great. When that great city comes down in lights and man dwells in a new heaven and a new earth, when God dwells with man forever and eternity, that's going to be wonderful. So I have hope for the future. But my friends, unless we as a country, we as a world, turn from our wicked ways, we're going to get worse and worse. But on an individual note, that's the world, that's this country. But God works with nations. God works with the world as a whole. But thankfully, God also works with us as individuals. Who was it? Is that it? Was it you? I was talking. You were talking to me about that this week. That God is a personal God. It was Ms. Ed, That's right. He's not just a God who only deals with the church as a whole. That only deals with the nation. That only deals with the world. He is a God who knows us individually. Who deals with us individually. Who died on the cross, yes, for all, but died for us individually. He died for you individually on that cross. If you would accept Him. And then our children's sermon scripture. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? <coughs> you don't understand. We are the church. But we are not necessarily the temple. Sue is the temple. April is the temple. Miss Christine is the temple. June is the temple. Individually, we are the temple of God. The place that God's Spirit, in all its greatness, all of its power, all of its love, all of its fullness, we are the place that it comes down and dwells in. And the hope individually here is this that all the promises that God gave to this temple here also apply to us. That where His Spirit dwells, He will sanctify it. His eyes or His attention will be upon it. His heart, His concern, His love will be there and be there perpetually. That word perpetually doesn't mean just forever. It means now and ongoing forever. It's not just like He's there. He's there, always, 24-7, seven, seven days a week. <laughs> Alright? Every minute, every day, every second, every millisecond, He is there. His eyes are on you. His heart is there for you. Every second of every day. Because no longer do we look to a building as a place that we can go and know that God has promised if we go to this place, He will hear us. But now, wherever we are as the temple, His Spirit dwells within us. And any time we hit our knees and we cry out to the Father, He will hear us. His concern is upon us and He will be with us forever and ever and ever and always. This is the hope that we have. My friends, if our country shatters and falls, God, please make it not be. But if our country shatters and falls, and we become like China, we become like the Middle East, we become like other nations, my friends, understand this, even in the midst of that horrid life, God is still God, and God will still be with us. We will be His temple. He will still have His eyes upon us. His concern will be towards us, and He will be with us forever. 
So our hope is not in the rebuilding of our country, though I ask God for that to be. Our hope is not in the right laws or the right leaders, though I, I pray that God will send us good men and good women to lead us and to guide us in this nation. Our hope is not in those things. Our hope is in the God of all eternity. And unlike Job, who couldn't find him, who didn't know even where to look, understand I'm not saying like these people of today say, that God is within all of us. We are all God. No, 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 no. God is completely separate, but because of His love, and because of who He is, He chooses to come and dwell inside of those who are His people. Those who have chosen to accept Him as Lord and Savior their lives. So where you are is where God is. Not because you're God, but because He is God and He loves you and He is always with you. Does that make sense? I pray that it does. I pray that it encourages you. This morning I want to give you a little homework for the week. Okay? Several years ago, I moved to Medellin, and I had prayed. Um, I've never been necessarily one that people say is a prayer woman. There are some people that, I don't know if it's their gift or their but they, they're on their knees constantly. And their grandmother's that way. They're, you, you probably know people that if you want somebody to pray for, you know who they are. Now, I pray, and God hears me, and I pray often. I pray often. I come in several days and and just kneel at the altar, and, and I, I do that. But, but I've never been one that's, I guess, considered a prayer warrior. I, I just, I don't know why. And through my life at various times, I've struggled and, um, you know, with praying as much as I know I need to. But I moved to Metter, Georgia, and I went in this church, and there was a place there called Guido Gardner. Look it up on the internet one day. But a place that uh, a, a man named uh, Michael Guido started, it's just a beautiful garden. Um, it's got statues and just beautiful things. Um, there's this beautiful chapel. It's all made of wood and it's glass all the way around. And it's just, it's just, it's just gorgeous. It's a small chapel. And, and people would just come there from all over just to, just to pray. And I had a pastor friend of mine um, invite me to a prayer time that other pastors had. And it started. we started at 8 in the morning and we would go till noon. Eight to nine to ten, that's just four hours. Okay, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. For four hours? Okay. Have you ever prayed for four hours before? I had not at that point. It was on Tuesday, once a month. And after that first time, I did not miss a Tuesday morning unless I was half dead. To go into the presence of God not looking at the time. I understand we live busy lifestyles. I understand that. I understand that completely. That's why a lot of people that you look at, teachers and stuff, they say, get up early, early in the morning. Or if you're a night person, let, her, let kids all go to bed and go find your place at night. That way you have the time to, to sit as long as you, as you need to, as God would have you sit and pray. But there's other times. Some of you have other times. But this week, find the time. That's your homework. I'm not saying you can pray about four hours, okay? But find a time this week to do something different than you've ever done before. What does that mean? Maybe it means usually you pray, you just kind of sit there and pray, and there's nothing wrong with it. God hears you. Maybe find a place that you can meet. Maybe find a place that you can separate yourself, that you can put your phone in the other room where you can't hear it, that the family is doing other things, or you've got them taken care of. Somewhere you can go for a period of time. You don't have to be there five minutes. You don't have to be there 10 minutes. You don't have to be there an hour. You don't have to be there two hours. You don't have to be there. We're not setting a time, nothing else. But go to a place where you have enough time to sit, to talk, and to listen. And just see what God has to say to you. If you don't understand or you don't hear anything, sit quietly. Think through the things that God has done. Think through the things you remember His Scriptures have said. And give God extra time. Go to God in a different way than you ever had before. That's your homework for this week. Next week there will be a quiz. No, there will be a quiz. But that's your homework for this week. See God in a different way than you've ever sought Him before. And see if God has
Lord God, today we love you. Lord God, today we thank you that you are a God who is with us. And Lord God, you not only are, are there when we call on you, but Lord, you are always with us because, Lord God, your spirit dwells within us. Lord, you have made us your temple, which, dear God, we are not deserving. We are not grand, beautiful buildings covered in gold, Lord. Lord, many of us are dirty. Lord God, many of us have the stain of sin upon us, dear God, more than we like to even think. But yet, God, as we've talked about before, when you look upon us, you don't see that stain of sin and that filth. Lord God, you look through the, through the lens of Christ Jesus. And you see something beautiful. Lord God, we thank you for that. We thank you for your love in spite of ourselves, dear God. That even while we were yet still in sin, Lord God, you sent your son to die for us. Lord God, I just ask this week that you give us a time and a place. Lord, that we can come to you differently. And Lord God, that you prepare our hearts. And Lord, when we get into that place, that dear God, we listen and we hear you speak to us. Lord, change us, move us. Lord God, bless our nation, dear God. Lord God, it is hurting, dear God. It is broken, dear God. Lord God, please be with our nation. Please help us to mend, dear God. But Lord, let it start with me. God, let it start with me. Lord, to you be all the glory and honor because you are so worthy, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, if you're able, stand with me. Let's sing our closing song together, family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join in with Jesus as we travel this side. For a part of the family, the family. God bless you.